on to our final session of the day, Unlimited Opportunity, the acceleration of podcast consumption and where it might take us. The world of audio is quickly evolving with podcast consumption continuing to accelerate thanks to the popularity of the format for both creators and audiences. In this session, moderated by Executive Head of Listener Podcasts, Grant Tothill, um, we'll see Grant joined by a panel of content and commercial experts from across the Australian podcast scene to discuss the role of podcasts in the audio landscape, how audiences are engaging with this format, and how advertisers can take advantage of these trends. I'll now hand over to Todd to introduce the panel. It's, um, it's very nice I get to call, be called Todders. I don't know who Grant is, but um, he left a little while ago to go to New York. Um, with podcast audiences continuing to grow, how do and are advertisers and brands taking advantage of the growing consumption? In a recent survey by Edison in the US, it is now saying we're moving to the world of super listeners with podcast listening spending up to 11 and a half hours a week listening to podcasts. As more new media emerges and we move to a digital on-demand world, attention becomes important to not only media companies, but also advertisers, and how they reach and communicate to the growing audiences beyond traditional media. In the next 30 minutes, we'll explore where the opportunities are, and is there a change on the horizon? To help answer those questions, please welcome our panel. First up, Rachel Corbett, Head of Podcasts and Digital Content at Nova Entertainment, Rachel is a podcaster, television and radio presenter, journalist and writer, podcast educator, and a finalist for the Radio Today Podcast Executive of the Year. Next, Del Fordham. Del is the head of audio at News Corp Australia and oversees on-demand content creation across News Corp mastheads, including podcasts such as Teacher's Trial, Maddie John's podcast, and I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin. Del was also a finalist in the Radio Today Podcast Executive of the Year. Got a few award winners here today. Um, Jennifer Goggin. Jen is the head of Factual and Drama at Listener Original Podcast. Before joining SCA and Listener, Jen worked for the BBC, creating award-winning history and audio documentaries. Jen has been responsible for developing and creating over 55 original podcasts across multiple genres and is now focused on developing Listener's new approach to audio docuseries, crime and audio fiction podcasts, along with educational-based series. Jen was named Thought Leader of the Year in the Radio Today Awards and was the executive producer of the Australian Podcast of the Year, Come Out Wherever You Are. Corey. Corey Layton is ARN's head of digital audio, leading the launch and continued growth of Australia's number one podcast publisher, iHeart. Corey was listed in the top 100 power list by Media Week and was named Radio Today's Podcast Executive of the Year. And finally, but not last, Nikki Rook. Nikki is the sales director for Nine Entertainment, Sydney, leading the commercialisation across all of Nine's portfolio. Nikki has a long and successful career across a number of different media companies, including radio, free-to-air television, digital publishing and digital audio and on-demand TV. And I think you'd say with those credentials, they're pretty well geared to ask a few questions. So let's get into it. Question number one. Podcast audiences are <laughs> continuing to grow. What are the growing genres and trends we're seeing? And I'll kick off with you, Corey. Feels like a game show. It is. Um, look, I, I think if, if anyone doesn't take a look, I think it's a shame it happens with the Triton podcast ranker. Uh, each and every month on the final page, all the way at the end, is this graph that keeps going up. And what it shows is listening to podcasts continues to go up, which I think for, for all of us is pretty incredible. Um, from a, an ARN and iHeart point of view, you know, we're talking like the, the number one crime show, Case File, Life Uncut, Imperfects, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's incredible to see all our shows, I think, collectively continue to grow. And now that we're out of COVID, we have rooms like this, which feels pretty good. Um, equally, that means the commute is back and podcasts definitely benefited from COVID. And what we're seeing is they're continuing to benefit from a return to the commute. Fantastic. Jen, what, what are you seeing in regard to what's, what genres are growing and what you're seeing going forward with audiences? Um, I suppose the unsurprising one is crime. Crime is the longest running content genre in the world, despite the fact that it has a bit of taboo around it in podcasting for some reason. If you watch the news or read a newspaper, you're a crime fan. 
crime continues to grow, but I guess what the interesting aspect of that is, is time spent listening to crime in one sitting is accelerating at a huge rate, which obviously for advertisers means longer time listening to one message if you choose a docu-series. Obviously the docu-series format in crime Serial was successful, Teachers Pet, all of these. That format is accelerating as people mature as audio producers and the audience matures with more complex stories. Um, I guess one that was more surprising was audio fiction in terms of the age demo we're seeing with people consuming audio fiction. Um, for the last audio fiction we released, what we saw was people aged 22 to 35 were the primary consumers for audio fiction. Um, I anticipated on release that it would be older um, as opposed to younger, but that younger demographic really enjoy it. I think it's a real competitor to audiobooks for them because of attention spans. If you can put sound design and actors into um, what would have been an audiobook and bring it to life in a different way, there's an opportunity, but we're also seeing it converting book listeners who traditionally weren't podcasting. So that's been good. And the last genre really is upskilling podcasts. So people, instead of doing online courses or reading where we would have traditionally read to learn something new, they're listening to a podcast. And that really is, I guess, people about 37 to 20. And where that's echoing is on TikTok, where people go to TikTok to learn a skill where we had all these life hacks. People are now traveling to podcasts to learn about superannuation, how to write a will, everything that they want to learn that fits within adult skills or financial skills, they're now gravitating towards podcasts. So that's a pretty interesting development. Great. Dell, you're seeing a slightly different world play out for you, aren't you? Yeah, well, the crime genre is huge for us. We, we, we see our listen through rates on our episodes continue to grow. Um, even the very longer episodes that we're publishing, sometimes two hour episodes, two and a half hour episodes, we're seeing our listen through rates still at 95% to 100%. We thought that might drop back with the commute coming back, with people spending less time at home, but we've actually seen it grow. Outside of genres, more around types, um, daily news, sport, topical content, yeah. talks to what our audience is expecting from our mastheads particularly. So. You know, we, 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 we really ramped up our daily news network and uh, what we were publishing day to day, sometimes multiple episodes. Um, we launched two new longer form news podcasts as well into the market. And also we just ramped up our sport, whether it's NRL, AFL, cricket, you name it. Um, so topical content for us, uh, we saw a boom and we still see that today, it continues. Fantastic. Rach, what about you with what's going on at Naiva? How, what are you seeing from your side of things? Well, I always find that what's the next true crime genre, which is like the genre that you feel like everybody's going to listen to immediately, it's very hard to say this specific genre yep. because I don't, I think that t true crime is an outlier. It's also frustratingly difficult to commercialise <laughs> and very high intensity from a production point of view. So yep. often it's not going to be your first option in terms of creating as a network yep. because you've got all of those factors factors at play that say, is this something that I can naturally make my money back on? Probably not. Yep. Um, so is there another genre that you can guarantee is going to get the kind of audiences that true crime has? I don't think so. I think daily news definitely, you know, that kind of more snackable content, people are getting used to that. I remember a time when the idea of the daily from the New York Times was like, oh my God, how revolutionary that we're getting news every day from, <laughs> from a, from a <laughs> podcast. Right. Um, so I think that that's still, you know, continuing to grow. But for me, I feel like it's less about genre and more about talent. You could think that a genre might not work in your mind, but a talent that people resonate um, towards and really connect with could deliver a show in a genre that you might not think works, but it's them that draws them to the show. So I think ultimately that is the main thing um, to kind of wrap around. I don't know... I mean, I'd love to find a genre that we're all like, this is the bankable you know, genre that's also commercializable in an easy way, but I don't know that that is gonna happen the way it does with true crime. Yeah. Nikki, um, question without notice. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> but it, it is in line that, I mean, you, you've spent a lot of time commercializing different things, and I, I think we'll get to it in a second, but do you think marketers or advertisers have really taken advantage of this growing audience at the moment? 
Um, no, I don't. I, I, and I think, I think they're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table um, by avoiding some really obvious opportunities. So talking there about true crime is a great example of that, and as Rach said, impossible or difficult to commercialise. Brands tend to stay away from it, yet it is where the scale is, and scale in podcasting is so valuable, because yep. it's hard to come by. That's right. So you've got high scale audience, it's a really engaged audience. Uh, we also see high completion rates on our crime podcasts. We see binging behaviour, you know, people can't get enough of it. So yep. really loyal and engaged audience, a great opportunity for brands, and we're really respectful about how we treat brands in those environments. We're very careful about where the ad markers go. We make sure you're not going to disturb some gruesome piece of content or a really you know, sad moment, yeah. um, but you know, probably not that different to advertising on CSI Miami, which plenty of brands do with, with no um, you know, blowback. Um, and same with news. You know, news, is, is, it's, scale, it's got high scale. It's, to to Dell's point, it's being consumed every single day. Um, it's certainly one of our most high performing categories, uh, but probably just seen as a bit like, yeah, whatever, it's just news and uh, tend to try and go to something that's new or shiny, but actually ignoring those really obvious opportunities right in front of them. Yeah, great. Um, just changing gears a little bit, as more titles start to move to either exclusive deals or pay-to-listen models such as Patreon, Apple, Lisbon, you'll be getting subscription services coming through. What's that really mean for advertisers? And I'll ask you first, will this eventually lead to advertisers missing out on opportunities? And will big successful podcasts eventually move? And I know you have a view on this still. Yeah, I, I feel like we've been a little bit more aggressive than most in locking our crime podcasts, our premium products, behind our paywalls. So there's a few exceptions to that within, you know, let's talk to the crime category and the investigations category again. So whether it's Teacher's Trial, Shandy, uh, I Catch Killers, or Life and Crimes, there are always on investigations and crime content. Now, they are sponsored, they are for sale, they carry advertisers and our hosts read and the integration is really strong. But what we found within the crime genre is specifically around those eight part, almost documentaries if you like, that are quite short run, quite highly produced. They're very difficult for us to monetize. They're, they're, they're over before you know it. Sometimes the content is extremely challenging and so on. So I think we've put four, four of them behind our paywalls so far, um, some windowed and some in entirety, and the new subscriptions coming through due to that tactic have been very strong. The retention of our current subscribers due to that tactic has been really um, exciting. Time spent in app, time spent on page and so on have been really good. So we're not losing anything by not monetizing those podcasts through advertising. So the future for us is almost all of our True Crime Australia eight-part serials will be locked behind our paywall or a paywall almost entirely for the foreseeable future. So we've got one uh, that launched recently called Bikey's Inc. that was available off-platform for a small period of time. We actually took that public feed down and now you can only get the Bikey's Inc. podcast, all eight episodes, behind our paywall and there may be another paywall down the track. This weekend, we got a new podcast launching called um, Mother's Guilt. You'll only ever, only ever be able to get that with a subscription, and that's our plan for the future. The eight-part serials that we create, almost entirely, they'll only be available behind a paywall. Right. Corey, that's uh, for someone like you that, you know, you, you guys look after Audio Boom, and they have some very big numbers, especially in crime. Um, how do you see the world? Do, do you think that we... The, subscription-based or paywalls are going to take over, or how do you see the world? No, like, sorry, Dell. before I say this. Um, <laughs> I, I think subscriptions are trying to solve a, a problem that, that doesn't actually exist. I think uh, when, when you look at some of the retention rates when it comes to advertising, about 5 to 10% of the audience skip an ad, which means 90%, 95% don't. And I think that's because the way that podcasts deliver advertising and having all the stuff you've heard, talent, deliver it in a credible way, is what, what's so powerful about it. And I think subscriptions do a few things that, that take that away. Probably from a, a creator perspective, I, I mean, you, you talk about those great crime, crime pieces that I imagine people slave away at. For a creator, you want as many possible people to, to hear your work. I think for, from an advertiser, we know that a bunch of them are willing to, to be part of this content. Yep. And I, I think for, for audiences, when we all launch a new show, 
it's hard to, to grow an audience really fast. And so to add another hoop and money to, to do that, I, I just doesn't sit with me. Sorry, again. No, that's okay. I mean, I can counter that. Our journalists, we have constant conversations with our journalists who, in some regards, do want the mass audience. And that's particularly re relevant for investigations when you're soliciting for leads and so on. You want as many people to hear that as possible. So therefore, that sits outside the paywall. But what we look at is the audience from a quality perspective, like the quality of the audience that we have behind the paywall, the people that are fully invested, the people that are not only taking out the subscription for the current product, but may continue to take out further subscriptions, lower churn rate, and be part of our network for longer. It's a constant challenge that our journos have. Whenever an, an idea comes to the table, and it's all about the mass audience, and we have to convince them, no, no, actually, this eight-part serial is worth more behind the paywall to us. It's a, a constant conversation. Yep. So it brings me on to my, my next question, which I'll probably go to you, Nikki, um, Rach and Jen, is given this audience growth, and, and Del, you've certainly gone a particular way because you said it was hard to monetize, and Corey, you're talking about the value of this audience, and we know different genres offer different audience profiles. I'll start with you, Nikki. Do you think that there is enough understanding of the difference in audiences? Are all just podcast audience, podcast audience? Or do you think there's a different level of understanding? And, and do you think that the creative, you were talking before about it, the creative ad execution is actually being thought about from creative agencies and or advertisers? No, I think there's still a lot of opportunity in that creative optimization. Uh, you, everything that you heard today is so true. And if for someone who's in the industry, you feel like, heard this so often, why isn't anyone listening and doing anything about it? And yeah. I think we're all so passionate about it, but because we know the opportunity and we've actually done some really interesting research to show the difference that gets made when you take care with your audio assets, when you do produce something that's distinctive and ideally that lives across all your assets, of course, not just in your digital audio assets, but also beyond. Um, but in terms of podcasting, no, and I think a lot of it, the audience, understand the audience, a lot of it's been kind of anecdotal and who do we think is going to listen to this and who do we think is going to appreciate it. But of course now we're getting more and more data to, right. to actually prove who that audience is. So we can actually prove that now and we can make it so much more addressable as we all build our first party data capabilities. So I think for brands they can lean in a lot more now to understand that audience and how to talk to them. And I guess the only thing I'd say is talking to that passion, I mean I've spent many quality hours with Matt Dixon who you just saw on stage talking about this topic, give it to us. Yep. Give it to us, we will handle it with care and integrity and we'll do the best possible job for you because I can see that it might seem like the juice is not worth the squeeze when you've got a whole big campaign running across multiple channels. Give it to us and we will execute it beautifully for you with, with absolute care across each platform to make sure it performs the best it can. Well said. Rachel. Yeah, I think that point's really important because for me, it's about trusting the people that are close to the content. We're the ones that even if, you know, even without data about the audience, if, some, if we put something on air, we'll hear about it straight away through the emails, through our reviews, like we get automatic feedback from our audience about a lot of things. And I think sometimes brands and agencies can feel more comfortable with saying, well, I appreciate that, but we're paying the money, so eventually you're just gonna do what we want, right? And it's not like we don't want to do what you want, it's just that in podcasting specifically, the impact of advertising is so much greater than any other medium. You know, it impacts the actual content, it impacts the hosts, like a television show wouldn't be impacted or a radio show wouldn't be impacted because the listener doesn't assume that that individual radio host or that individual host on the television let that ad go to air. But in a podcast, that is what it feels like. It feels like it's a part of that content and that that has been approved, especially if, if it's in the voice of the host mm. and endorsed by that person. So we're trying to make that experience into an ad as much like content as possible to avoid people from skipping those ads because that's ultimately, we want that for an advertiser because we want them to keep coming back. So I think when we're having those conversations, the pushback, there needs to be a little bit more give and take there because we're not pushing back because we don't want your brand in our show. We want it in our show and we want it to work real well because that means we can keep making the show. That's right. um, you know, so I think that kind of relationship is really important to get that right. Yeah, well said. Yep. Jen, anything to add? Um, I guess I echo all the frustration with um, a team working very hard to create content that engages audiences and the push and pull between advertisers who want to control creative. It 
sticks out like a sore thumb from the environment. It creates a lean out moment. We don't want that. But I think there's a huge piece of education to be done on breaking down kind of the stereotypes of who listens to what, who listens to crime, who listens to business. It's so diverse. We have the data sets to prove what people consume, but also what are the things that they consume along with their primary genre. So if you think about it, it's about need states and mood. I want something on a Friday night, I'll go to crime so I can escape into it. But on Monday, I want to know how to get better at leadership or something like that. So that behavior changes. We have the data sets for that, but quite, on, but quite honestly, we come up against crime people are kind of salacious, tabloid readers, whatever. But the data sets say that crime consumers are most likely to be third level educated, are most likely to invest in high quality luxury items that last, are more likely to take a look at investing taxes, home security. There's actually a lot of money in this cohort, but people that aren't thinking about it that way because they're just saying crime scary well crime and news are kind of interchangeable and then the next layer out from that because it's a digital product you can watch your audience travel so when you're buying um your messaging what you can do if you tailor it to the environment is buy them when they listen to crime and buy them when they listen to the business podcasts that we know that they listen to and then lean into the creatives of the environment and what you'll get is this unique opportunity to have people leaning in for hours and only hearing your messaging. It's such an uncluttered environment and I don't think people value it that way. And I don't think that they look at kind of the diversity of consumption in one listener and how to just ring fence them the way you get chased around the internet by ads. We can do that with data, but there's a real fear around leaning into understanding it. Yeah, well said. Um, everyone's making a podcast. Brands are, and I don't know, this is your pet topic, <laughs> Rachel. So, Brandon. I'm getting a reputation <laughs> in the industry. <laughs> Rachel did a presentation on this for Podcast 24, so that's, that's why I'm saying that. Um, branded podcasts have become very popular. I think it's almost like Facebook back in the day. Everyone's got to have a Facebook page when it's mm. not right. Everyone, every company thinks they're going to have a branded podcast. Um, so we all get to say here, top two <laughs> points. Um, to make a successful branded podcast. And I'll start with you, Rachel, because this is your pet subject. Okay. So top two points. Yeah. Okay, my number one is think about what the audience wa wants, not what you want to say to the audience. And I think more often than not, that is the problem with every brief I get for a branded podcast that's not going to work, is it's this is what you want to say to an audience. An audience does not care. They're not interested. They're not going to listen. And you want us to start from scratch to build an audience with an idea no one wants. So that is the main kind of thing. I also think the other thing is that you have to be more com comfortable with a, um, like a low-touch approach. So if you want it to appeal to an audience, I think keeping your brand out as much as possible so it feels like genuine content made for an audience as opposed to content made by a brand, that is really important. Excellent. Del? Um, I'm going to keep an eye on time here and just do one. This is quite easy. Is just be very clear with the client on what their KPI is. If they want to create eight parts of a podcast and want it to be the next Hamish and Andy, it's not going to happen. If they want the biggest podcast, it's not going to happen. Mm. So why are they making a podcast? A very clear conversation with the client. Is it a marketing exercise? Is it to, be, is it to humanize your C-suite? I don't know, whatever it may be. What's the KPI? And then build from there. Excellent. Jen? I'll go with one as well. Um, what value are you offering the listener? They give you their time. What are you giving back to them? You give them a good experience that they can take away and talk about. You already grow your brand and you, you build that loyalty to a brand. Offer them something. Don't just talk at them. Excellent. Corey? Uh, I it's would hard, isn't it? I mean, it's getting harder as we yeah. go along. <laughs> <they're taking laughs> all the, all the my my one tip would be don't make a branded podcast. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, amen. Think, I think there's like 1% one, <laughs> 1 of brands in the world that should and there's 99% of brands that should not in the same way that like should I have a branded TV show? No. <laughs> um, 
it, it, it's it, most often than not, it's about hitch a ride with an existing show that is yep. doing amazing things versus starting an audience from scratch. Um, there are very few podcasts in a branded space that will do well. There are some, but they're the ones where you don't have a client going, so how many times are you going to mention my brand and where's my logo on the artwork and all the things we know um, it, it's not about. Excellent. <laughs> Nikki? Um, look, you've covered most of it. You're allowed I'll, to say ditto if you want to. <laughs> no, I'll do, you know what, I'll use a positive example where I think it works really well. When you have a shared conversation, shared values or a shared ambition. So we've just partnered with ComBank um, on, a, on a podcast called Scams. Because our audience is calling us every day to talk about scams. They're scared. They're feeling vulnerable. ComBank want to lead that conversation. They're the you know, leading fraud detection in the market. It's an absolute match made in heaven because our audience want to know more about this. We want to talk about it. There's utility for the audience. For me, that's a great example. It's also rare. I, I, I read about that and I went, you beauty, what a great example of a branded podcast. You don't feel that way very often. Yeah, that's true. Very good. Okay, we're nearly out of time. So the last three minutes, besides the one question I want to ask you at the end, which is your favourite fruit, um, <laughs> what's everyone's number one piece of advice when it comes to agencies or advertisers maximising the growth of podcasting, either with radio or original podcasts? So we'll start with you, Nikki, and go back this way. I think it's um, understanding what you want to use it for. It's really as simple as that. You know. The, the, from going from radio podcasting, which again has the scale, so if you want to talk to a really engaged audience every single day, that's the way you go. But if you want to create a conversation and something that's a bit more unique, you know, go to a bespoke original podcast. It's understand the the, the role of each and, and why you'd use it. Excellent, Corey. I would say uh, be part of the content. Don't interrupt the content. And, and I think uh, as we've all kind of echoed across the panel, trust in the talent, trust in the publishers. Yes, it's making some more bespoke creative for yet another vertical, um, but it is worth letting those publishers and talent take care of it and say it in, in their own authentic way for their own audiences. Excellent. Jen? Um, I'd say stop going for scale. Look at how you can get into a targeted environment with the right message. If you sell your product into a bunch of people who have data representative that they want that product, that's an easier conversion to action and conversion to sale. Stop going for a big wide shading on the street and just walk it into the right room. Excellent. Del? Um, I'd say think about the value of the listener. Um, I mentioned that before. Whether it's behind a paywall through a subscription or in a, in a public feed, the journey that the listener has taken to press play on that podcast and get your message. You know, often they've had that content recommended to them. They've downloaded the app, they've searched for it, they've hit the follow or subscribe button, they've put their headphones in. There's a real journey to that. They're already um, invested in that content before they press play and have a full appreciation of that. It's a really valuable um, aspect of the uh, process. Fantastic. Rachel? Uh, I would say work with us. We're not making content because we're a bunch of creatives in a room who are just wanting to do it just for the fun of it. We are cr trying to create shows that are commercialisable, that will have a long life, that will, you know, that will be around for a really long time. So we want every brand to have a really good experience and to keep coming back. And we know that content and that audience best. And so just work with us to get the right creative so it doesn't feel like a situation where you're being pulled out of the content. Um, you know, it does feel like a seamless part of that show. Excellent. Okay, 20 seconds left. Favourite fruit? This is going to cost me $200. <laughs> I know what you're doing here. What do you mean? Would kumquat be your favourite fruit? Did you not see my email yes. before this? Definitely oh, mine. He wanted to get kumquat into this presentation. So I got it in, point. so I win and 50 Todd bucks. Thank it. you. <laughs> That's it, guys. Thank you very much. We're exactly on time, unlike Kyle. Thanks a lot.